Good afternoon. As dean of the law school, one of the special functions I have is to introduce many of our speakers and our conferences. This one is always a treat for me. The Judge Ben C. Green Distinguished Lecture, which is endowed by our great friend, Roe Green. Uh, this is also a very special Ben Green Lecture, not only because of the speaker, um, but because it is our last Ben Green Lecture. Roe has graciously consented to take the money that endows this lecture and put it directly into student scholarships. And for that role, we are so very grateful. So, no surprise, we're fortunate to welcome Roe Green, who's a great friend of our law schools and a great friend of mine. Roe is the daughter of the late Judge Ben C. Green, who's an alum of the class of 1930, and his late wife, Sylvia Green. In 1961, Judge Green was our first graduate to receive the prominent appointment of federal judge of the United States District Court for the Northern District of Ohio. His appointment was made by President John F. Kennedy, and he served in the role for 20 years. Judge Green, who possessed a real passion for legal education, was highly regarded both in the profession and in the community. He also embraced a passion for politics and a commitment to his long judicial career. Fortunately for the law school, he also inspired the extraordinary philanthropy of his late wife and of his daughter, Roe who together established the Ben Green Visiting Professorship, which is now a chaired professorship held by Professor Kevin McMonagall. Later, Roe, on behalf of her family and in honor of her late father, gave the largest individual outright gift ever received by the law school for our significant library renovations, and then went on to endow this lecture series, which will now provide scholarship money for deserving students. Roe also continues to be one of Northeast Ohio's most dedicated philanthropists to our region's arts and cultural institutions and those of Denver, Colorado, and Jupiter, Florida. We are really fortunate to have Roe here, and it's an honor once again to say thank you. Roe, please, thank you so much. I also have the privilege that I've had before of introducing our speaker today, Ken Feinberg. Mr. Feinberg founded Feinberg Rosen LLP in 1992. But that is just the beginning. Ken has been involved in, he is our nation's mediator. He is our nation's arbitrator. He's been involved in resolving thousands of disputes involving a wide range of interests and clients. In the commercial sector, Mr. Feinberg designed, implemented, and administered an ADR settlement program involving Liberty Mutual Insurance Company, Zurich NA Insurance Company, and Hurricane Katrina and other Gulf hurricane claimants. He also served as distribution agent for AIG Fair Funds claimants and has been the fund administrator for a variety of claimant funds totaling more than a billion dollars. In his capacity as an arbitrator, Mr. Feinberg helped determine the fair market value of the original Zabruder film of the Kennedy assassination and legal fees in Holocaust slave labor litigation. It's really kind of hard to just say what Ken has done and give any sense of who he really is. Um, this, this man is an extraordinary servant. And as those of you who attend our commencement hear me say annually, the beauty of law is the opportunity to serve. Well, Ken embodies that in ways that everyone should just aspire to. He was designated by President Obama and BP to serve as an administrator, the Gulf Coast Claims Facility from 2010 to 2011. He served as a special master for TARP, paying bank executives or not, um, and One Fund Boston set up for victims of the Boston Marathon funding. Perhaps most significantly, he served as special master of the Federal September Victim Compensation Fund for the September 11th victims. And in that capacity, I have almost first-hand knowledge of how good Mr. Feinberg is. My dad represented several 9-11 claimants before Ken Feinberg. And I, at the time, I recall my dad telling me about the fairness, the reasonableness, the judicious approach, and the basic decency that Ken exhibited in distributing funds to victims of that disaster. Throughout his career, Ken Feinberg has made the law work in unconventional ways to meet unique catastrophes, and of course is the foremost expert on victim compensation in the United States. 
He's a man who knows much about many things, from opera to baseball to legal education. Um, he is truly the kind of person that graces our law school. Ken Feinberg, thank you very much. Please welcome. I want to um, I want to thank the dean at the outset. He says I know a lot about opera and baseball. Um, I guess it was obstruction when he slid into third base. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't require any mens rea, so it's a strict liability offense. So if the runner is impeded, that's the end of it, I guess. Everybody seemed to think it was the right call, but I don't know who will win the World Series. But I want to thank the, uh, the dean for uh, uh, those kind words. I want to thank Ro for her um, philanthropy, for uh, so much that she does to validate the memory of her father. And I hope that in some small way my work and what I do exemplifies uh, what Ben stood for as a judge uh, and as a man. And I'm honored, actually, to be here today to deliver the endowed Ben Green lecture. I didn't realize until the dean introduced me that I'm laboring under some real stress since it's the last lecture <laughs> that, of the Ben Green endowed lecture series, so it better be good. Um, and I better be on my, uh, on my A game today during the next uh, a half hour to 40 minutes. So I'll do my best to, uh, to vindicate the judge uh, and you and the law school. Now, when the dean introduced me just now, he neglected to mention my most recent book. <laughs> Who gets what? Fair Compensation in Times of National Tragedy, Public Affairs Press, 2012. Now, you may have trouble finding this book these days on Amazon or a local bookstore, if there is one. Uh, you may have trouble finding it. Don't worry. My personal supply of that book is virtually inexhaustible. <laughs> So if anybody has trouble finding the book, let the dean know and we'll manage to uh, do something about it. Um, now he mentioned my work, 9-11, BP oil spill, the Pesar. The Pesar, that was an interesting assignment, the Pesar. That was the job I had determining the salary, the compensation of certain corporate officials who received top money, taxpayer money, so that the company would stay afloat, AIG, GM, uh, Bank of America, Citigroup. They call me the Pesar. Now, that's a, a, a term. I mean, my grandmother would be very confused. <laughs> Pesar. She wouldn't know what to make of that title. But it was an interesting assignment. Now, in all of these assignments, a few basic principles are important when we talk about unconventional responses to unique tragedy, tailoring the law to fit the challenge, to meet the challenge. We're in a law school, so let's get a few basic principles out of the way so that everybody is on the same page when we talk about some of my work. You will note that the 9-11 tragedy resulted in Congress passing a law 11 days after 9-11. And the law simply said, anybody who would rather take compensation from a fund funded entirely by the taxpayer, not airline money, not World Trade Center money, not um, mass port, port authority money. This is public money, 100% of it. Anybody who would rather accept a check from the United States people, taxpayers, rather than go to court, if you don't want to sue the airlines and the World Trade Center and, and all these other private 
entities, whether they're responsible for the tragedy or not, beside the point. If you don't want to sue, you can come into a very generous program funded entirely by the taxpayer. You don't have to. You can go file a lawsuit in New York City. But if you'd rather take the money, you can do so. In return, you waive your right to sue. You can't sue anybody. You give up your right, and in return, you get a check. And Feinberg will design and administer that program. Well, over 33 months, we distributed about $7 billion to 5,300 people who either lost loved ones or were physically injured. The average award, tax-free, $2 million for a death claim, $400,000 for a physical injury claim. And in return, you waive your right. Only 94 people decided to sue rather than come into the fund. The fund was a tremendous success. It did exactly what Congress wanted. It diverted 97% of all of the families that lost a loved one out of the tort system into a special program. And that's how it worked. Only 94 people decided to sue, and they all settled their cases five years later. There was never a trial over who was negligent or responsible for 9-11. It was it. It worked. It worked. But notice in that case, you waive your right to sue if you take the taxpayer's money. Now, BP, the same thing. After the BP oil spill, BP went into the White House to see President Obama, came out and said, anybody who voluntarily wants to take money from a special fund, not funded by the taxpayer, funded by BP, we will front $20 billion. 20 billion. And if that's not enough, we'll give more. And in return, we will pay all eligible claims arising out of the oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. You don't have to. You can litigate if you want. And we agree with the president. Ken Feinberg will design and administer that program. Well, in 16 months, we paid out about six and a half billion dollars and received 220,000 releases from businesses and individuals promising not to sue. A trade. A trade. The program worked. Now, I must say, BP, we received a million two hundred thousand claims from 50 states. I got about 250 claims from Ohio. I didn't know the oil got this far to Ohio. We got about 250 claims against the BP uh, oil company in Ohio. Most of them weren't eligible. Some were, but for the most part, they weren't. But we got claims from Alaska, 400 from Massachusetts, um, 35 foreign countries. You build and announce a program like this, they will come. <laughs> they will come in force, and they did. Most of the claims were denied. but. 220,000 people waived their right to sue and took the money. Paid for by BP. Tax-free. Now, those programs, 9-11, BP, are very, very different from the other programs we read about in the newspaper. The Boston Marathon. After the Boston Marathon bombings, $60 million privately donated by over 100,000 individuals and business donors from all over the country. After Newtown, Connecticut, the Sandy Hook shootings of the little first graders, $11.5 million. Virginia Tech, the deranged student gunman who killed 13 people. Uh, excuse me, killed 32 people, seven, seven million. Uh, Aurora, Colorado, the movie shootings, Dark Knight, where the gunman comes in and sprays the movie theater patrons, 
five million. All of these programs are private donations. Private. People watch on CNN, they send in money. The money that is distributed in those programs is not part of the tort system. It's not an alternative to the tort system. You can take that money if you want. It's a gift. You can turn around and hire a lawyer and sue if you want to do that. In Virginia Tech, a few families did. A few families did sue, and they won against Virginia Tech. But make sure you keep them separate. The 9-11 fund and the BP oil spill, that is, th those programs are alternatives to the tort system, to lawsuits. If you take that money, you waive your right to sue. All these other programs that you read about, like Boston Marathon, that's a gift. That's found money. You don't, you don't, you don't owe any obligation other than to accept it and do what you want with it. And it has nothing to do with the tort system. Now, why do I make that distinction? In some respects, the distinction's irrelevant. When it comes time to trying to decide who gets what, whether it's a, um, a, a tort alternative or a, or a gift, you run into the same compensation problems. But there are very important distinctions, you see. I doubt very much that you will ever again see a 9-11 victim compensation fund. I mean, I think it was the right thing to do at the time. And I think it served a very valuable public service. And it demonstrated our nation's empathy for the victims of the horrible uh, terrorist attacks. I am constantly defending that program as sound public policy. It worked. Don't ever do it again. Don't ever do that program again. The idea that the American people will pay compensation to certain innocent victims while everybody else fends for themselves, I have great difficulty with that. You should have read some of the emails I received when I was administering the 9-11 fund. Dear Mr. Feinberg, my son died in Oklahoma City. Where's my check? Dear Mr. Feinberg, I don't get it. My daughter died in the basement of the World Trade Center in the original 1993 attacks committed by the very same people. Why aren't I eligible? And it didn't stop with terrorism, you see. Dear Mr. Feinberg, explain something to me. Last year, my wife saved three little girls from drowning in the Mississippi River, and then she drowned a heroine. Where's my check? You better be careful when you carve out for very generous public compensation only these people. Everybody else, sorry, fend for yourself. It's not sound public policy in a society which frowns on elitism, believes in equal protection of the law, and yet is very egalitarian, and yet only these people get tax-free compensation. I don't think it's sound public policy, but I think it was the right thing to do as a one-off program, as a very unconventional response to a unique catastrophe in America, rivaled only by the American Civil War, Pearl Harbor, and the assassination of President Kennedy. That's it. And I think the program was the right thing to do. Just it's a precedent for nothing. There was no 9-11 fund for Katrina. A thousand people died. There was not even the slightest in interest in Congress having a 9-11 fund for Katrina victims or Sandy victims or tornadoes or hurricanes or terrorist attacks. 
There's no 9-11 fund. I don't think you'll ever see the BP oil spill fund either again. Now, why do I say that? That's not taxpayer money. Yeah, it's not. But you show me a company that's going to front $20 billion before there's even a trial and say, we'll pay all legitimate claims. We want to get the money out. We'll pay the claims. And we'll worry later about liability, about collecting contribution from co-defendants like Halliburton or, or uh, Transocean. Right now, we want to pay the claims. I don't think you're going to see that again. You haven't seen it before or since. I mean, $20 billion, that's not chump change. We paid $6.5 billion in 16 months with a claims program. Then they paid $2 billion more for cleanup and state government claims. The whole thing came to about uh, over $10 billion. And now they're still litigating down there with others after the fund's long gone. The program worked exactly as the president wanted. But I just, I think it's a wonderful idea. I just don't think you'll see it again. Maybe you will. Maybe there'll be a Fortune 500 oil company. But even in the, not even in BP, again, I get these emails. Mr. Feinberg, I've been waiting 22 years to get my claim paid by Exxon Valdez. How come I can't come into a BP fund and get my oil money? I've been waiting and waiting and waiting. I still haven't been paid for Alaska. Sorry, this is just for the BP victims. So you see, there are some very real public policy issues. Now, now forget tragedy for a minute, or at least that type of physical injury and death. The Pazar. You'll never see that program again. Never. Congress bailed out those seven companies so they wouldn't go belly up, right? AIG beat in the meltdown in 2009. AIG, uh, Bank of America, Citigroup, GM, GMAC, uh, Chrysler, Chrysler Financial. Congress says, here's taxpayer money so you'll stay. You're too big to fail. And then a week later, they pass a law. And the law says populist revenge. Populist revenge. We bailed out all of those big Wall Street companies. We now own you. We loaned you taxpayer money to survive. Well, we loaned you, so now the taxpayer is a creditor. And therefore, we're going to set your pay. All of you corporate officials at these seven companies, Treasury, the Treasury Department, will decide what you're going to make. Secretary of the Treasury, Geithner, Tim Geithner, called me up. I'm not doing this. You do it. Okay. <laughs> I'll do it. So I set their pay. Government shouldn't be setting private corporate pay. It shouldn't. Every company's different. Everybody has a different culture. But populist revenge, Congress. We bailed them out. We want to get a pound of flesh. So until they pay back every nickel with interest, we, the Treasury, delegating to Ken Feinberg, will determine what the CEO, the CFO, and the key corporate officials are going to make. Well, that was a sort of a sideshow. It's only 175 people I'm doing this with. First of all, Bank of America and Citigroup, I did it once for 2009. They borrowed money to get up, pay back the taxpayer. They didn't want me setting their pay, so they borrowed money and got out which is okay, that was the law. And then for everybody else, the other five companies, then four companies, I set their pay. Like I determined compensation in, in uh, BP in 9-11. Now, the pays are, you'd meet these people, these corporate officials, <laughs> and you'd say to them, by law, I've got to set your pay. Uh, and then they would say, well, okay, but I just want you to know, I am essential. <laughs> I am an irreplaceable official. If you don't pay me and I leave, the company's going to go belly up, and the taxpayer's money will be lost. 
I am irreplaceable. Well, first you say to each of them in a nice way, the graveyards are filled with irreplaceable people, right? <laughs> then they say, then they say, if you don't give me what I want, I'm going to go not to a competitor across the street. I'm going to go get a big job in China. Everybody's going to China to work. Everybody said they're going to China. Well, we set their pay. Now, it was very, very difficult to set corporate pay. And I'll tell you why. People think when you pick up a newspaper, that corporate pay is all about material gain. I want this money because I want a third car or a fourth. I want a summer home on Long Island. I want to send my kids to private school at Andover and St. Paul's and Exeter. That would be easy. If it was all about material gain, it would be easy. But that's not the mindset of these people. I found, I learned a lesson. The mindset of these corporate officials is money as a barometer of self-worth. Wow. That gets very emotional, you see. Well, sir, what about your wonderful family as a barometer of self-worth? No. What about your, your work in the community as a barometer of self-worth? Nope. Money. When I look in the mirror in the morning and I say to myself, am I, have, have I achieved success? Dollars. Dollars. And it gets very emotional when you cut somebody's pay by 50% and their cash by 90%. You're going to get into some real argument about self-worth. Very emotional. Just like 9-11, nobody, I gave any 9-11 victim or family that lost a loved one the opportunity to come to see me one-on-one, -on -one, privately, confidential, out of the public eye. 900 people came to see me, one by one, over 33 months. The most chilling thing in my life that I ever experienced. Nobody, I, 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 emotional, you see, nobody comes to talk to you about money. That's not why people come to meet me and get a check. That's not why they come. It's much more sophisticated than that. People come one-on-one -on -one to meet the person who's cutting the check to validate the memory of a lost loved one. That's why they come. Mr. Feinberg, thank you for this hearing. I lost my wife at the World Trade Center. We were married for 25 years. And I'd like to start this hearing by showing you a video of our marriage 25 years ago. Well, Mr. Jones, you don't have to show that video. It won't have any bearing on compensation, and <clears throat> I want you to see what those murderers did to my angel. Okay, go ahead. And there's the video 25 years ago of their marriage. See? See how beautiful she looked that day? Mr. Feinberg, I lost my son. He was at the Pentagon. He died. He was 26 years old, but I'd like to show you a video of his bar mitzvah when he was 13. There it is. Look how great he looked. I want you to see it. No one comes to talk about money. They want to validate a memory. And woe be unto you if you in any way question that memory or question their thinking when they turn to you and they say, you're denigrating the memory of my lost loved one, you don't even know. I'll tell you a story. It's a law school. We're at law school here today. 9-11. A lady comes to see me. She says, Mr. Feinberg, I lost my daughter. She was a second year associate at a law firm in the World Trade Center. And she died that day. Now, you're going to calculate compensation for her. 
But when you calculate your compensation, don't you dare use her second year law associate salary because she was going to be a partner in that firm six years after, six years later. And in fact, in the eighth year, she was going to have her name on the letterhead of the firm. They were going to change the name of the firm. This is a mother talking to me. Well, Mrs. Jones, you know, these law associates, they don't usually stay at a law firm that long, and they certainly don't usually change the name of the firm. And uh, Did you ever meet my daughter? No, I didn't. Well, don't tell me what I know. You never even met my daughter. She was going to be Jones and Jones was going to become Jones, Jones, and Smith. Eight years. So when you calculate the compensation, make sure it's a named partner that is the economic loss quotient of the calculation. Because she was going to be. People say to me, does it help to have a law degree? A law degree in this type of business is a wash. Better a divinity degree <laughs> or a degree in psychiatry. Steve Hoffman, every day he has a divinity degree and a degree in psychiatry in his work, believe me. He knows, he gets it. That's what happens. You're dealing very emotionally. Now that was a problem in 9-11. 24-year-old woman comes to see me, 9-11, a hearing. Mr. Feinberg, I lost my husband. He was a fireman at the World Trade Center. He left me with my two children, six and four. Now, you're going to give me $2.3 million tax-free. I want it in 30 days. I say to her, 30 days, why do you, I've got to run the, uh, the, through this hoops here with the Treasury Department, verification, and got to get you the money. It may take more than 30 days. No, 30 days. Why? Why? I'll tell you why. I have terminal cancer. I have 10 weeks to live. My husband was going to survive me and take care of our two children. Now they're going to be orphans. I've got to get that money, Mr. Feinberg, and I've got to set up a trust fund as fast as I can. Well, we accelerated the money. Eight weeks later, we went to her funeral. You can't make these stories up. You can't make them up. That's the tough part of what I do, you see. It's the empathy, the interaction with human beings. Not about numbers and law and proximate cause and duty and uh, negligence. It's about helping individuals and what it means. Now, let me give you one more example. Then we'll move on. But I want you to get one more because I'd like to, it's a pretty sophisticated crowd. What would you do with this one in 9-11? Lady comes to see me sobbing. I thought she was going to collapse in my office. Mr. Feinberg, I lost my husband. He was a fireman. He left me with our three kids, six, four, and two. Every, he was Mr. Mom. Every day that he wasn't at the firehouse, he was home teaching the six-year-old how to play baseball, teaching the four-year-old how to read, reading a bedtime story to the two-year-old. And what a cook! He cooked all our meals. He was the gardener around the house. He was Mr. Mom. Mr. Feinberg, the only reason I haven't jumped out a window and joined him are three children. But my life is over. It is empty. Without Mr. Mom, I will never be the same. I am finished. Sobbing, she leaves. The next day, I get a telephone call from a lawyer in Queens. Mr. Feinberg, did you meet yesterday with the woman? Yeah. And the three kids, six, four, and two, with Mr. Mom? Yeah. Now look, Mr. Feinberg, you've got a tough job. I don't envy you. But I got to tell you, she doesn't know that Mr. Mom has two other kids by his girlfriend in Queens, five and three. 
And I'm telling you this because I represent the girlfriend, and when you cut your check from the 9-11 fund, there's not three surviving children, there's five surviving children. Well, but I'm sure you'll do the right thing, click, he hangs up, you know. <laughs> Dear Teller, Dear Teller, we went, that's what keeps you up at 3 a.m. Dear Teller, Mrs. Jones, there's this other family here. Well, we didn't tell her. We cut one check to her as the surviving spouse with the three kids, and then we cut, unbeknownst to her, we cut a second check to the girlfriend as guardian of the two kids. Paternity and everything. That was it. That's what we did. I don't know if that was right. We were divided. The staff, we were going back and forth on that. Those are the problems, you see. Unconventional responses to tragedy lead to unconventional challenges. BP, a million two hundred thousand claims. The problem in BP was volume and no proof. People are filing claims with no proof. Mr. Feinberg, I lost a hundred thousand dollars. We couldn't fish. Okay, uh, show me that you lost a hundred thousand. Oh, we do things with a handshake down here. Well, I'm not paying $100,000 on a handshake. What do you got? Do you have tax returns? No. Okay. What do you got? Got a checkbook? Yep. Here. Corporate profit and loss statements? Here. Okay. Trip tickets that you went fishing? Here. Okay. I'm going to cut you a check from the Gulf Coast Claims Facility, BP, for $100,000. And you'll get it in about two weeks. Now, with it, you're going to get a 1099 from the IRS. He looks at me, he goes, I waive it. You can't waive a 1099. <laughs> I've got to send you the 1099. You've got to send me a 1099? I'm withdrawing my claim. What? You mean you're going to give up $100,000 because you're going to get, rip it up. If you're sending me a 1099, he probably never paid taxes in his life. People say, you know, that must be the way things are down in the Gulf. I think that's the way. I mean, i got to tell you, you get a little bit cynical in this business. I'm not sure it's anywhere else, anywhere else, when it comes to money and a tax return and corroboration. So that the, the problem we had with BP was proof. People didn't have back up their claim. The other problem is this, in all of these programs, you talk about a common problem in every compensation fund, whether it's an alternative to tort or it's a gift. Let me tell you a problem. There's two problems in every one of these cases I've done. Every one. First, how much money do you pay somebody for death, tragedy, injury? In absolute dollars, what's the right number? What's the right number? Uh, Boston Marathon, um, terrible, terrible injuries, um, um, limbs, amputations. Uh, Mr. Jones, I'm here to tell you that you're going to get $2,200,000 tax-free for your double amputation. $2,200,000? Oh. For a double amputation? You're giving me two minutes? I got two answers for that. One, keep the money. Give me my legs back, Mr. Feinberg. How's that? Why don't you give me the legs back? You can keep the money. I want my legs back. Mr. Jones, I don't have that power. I wish I did. Two million. Put a zero next to it. I have no limbs. Twenty million, maybe. Maybe. So problem number one in all of these cases, what is a life worth? What are injuries worth? How do you read? It's Solomon. It's Solomonic. I don't think there's any formula. But that's only the first problem, you see. In every one of these cases, you have a second problem. Everybody counts other people's money, you see. It's not just what am I getting. Why are you denigrating the memory of my wife who died when the next door neighbor you're giving an extra million? 
What, you never even met my wife. What do you have against her? Mr. Feinberg, I work in a New Orleans fish market, uh, a New Orleans restaurant, and I lost all sorts of tips and wages because of the oil spill. Now, you're sending me a check for $12,000. But you're sending my next door neighbor, who's a waiter in the very same restaurant, $20,000. What did I say wrong? What do you have against me? Mr. Jones, you filed a tax return that said you lost $12,000. He filed a tax return that proves he lost $20,000. You, you, you know, you can't have it both ways. You filed a different income statement than he did. That's the reason? We both had the exact same job. So what if one fudges or does a, I mean, come on. What do you got against me? That's America. That's the problem you run into. That's the problem. It's not only absolute dollars, but everybody counts other people's money. And that makes it even tougher, you see. So after you get through all of the vagaries, you know, the differences, BP, versus 9-11, versus the Marathon, versus Newtown, Connecticut. At the end of the day, you've got the same checklist of questions, right? And you all know, every time I do one of these, here are the issues. Here's the summary. Here's the agenda. One, who's how much money do you have? One. <laughs> that drives a lot of us. Do you have 20 billion? 60 million or 5 million makes a difference. You only have so much to distribute. That drives everything. How much money do you have? Two, who's eligible? Who's eligible? In 9-11, in, in Congress said under no conditions can you pay people suffering only mental trauma. Said it right in the statute. There's got to be a physical injury. In Virginia Tech, we paid mental trauma only for those students who were in the classroom where the carnage took place. One student came to me and said, Mr. Feinberg, uh, my, my friend to my left got his head blown off. My, my friend to my right got her head blown off. As the fellow pointed, the, the murderer pointed the gun, click. Russian roulette, no more bullets. While he was reloading, I jumped out a window. I can't get out of bed now, no injury, but I'm shaking. We paid mental trauma for students in the classroom, but we didn't pay mental trauma for students across the street watching all of this unfold on a dorm, at a dorm. Don't have enough money. Who's eligible? What's the methodology for calculating damage, you see? Now that's a law school question. If you're teaching torts, then you know. BP and 9-11 are alternatives to the tort system. You're trying to keep people out of the tort system. You have to pay them according to the tort system. Economic loss and non-economic loss. Everybody gets a different amount of money. In these other funds that aren't tied to the tort system, no release, you can do what you want with the money, you can have a much more uh, egalitarian formula. Anybody who lost a limb gets X. Anybody who lost a loved one gets Y. The same. Anybody who lost one limb gets Z. Anybody in the hospital, how long are you in the hospital? If you were in the hospital over a month, you get X. If you were there three weeks, you get Y. If you're there two weeks, you get Z. You do it that way. Much easier. Much less divisive among people, very emotional people. But that's the methodology you've got to decide. Proof. Next issue. What do you have to prove to get your money? What do you have to prove? Next, due process. Are you going to give everybody a hearing? I did in 9-11. We did in Virginia Tech and, and, and Boston Marathon, and, uh, but not BP. A million two hundred thousand claims. I mean, who can have hearings? Much more difficult without hearings. Due, due process. And then, finally, the consideration for getting a check, as we've talked about. BP and 9-11, you give up your right to sue. All these other funds, you don't. Now, that's how it works. Now, a few concluding points, then time for questions. What I do is not rocket science. People in this room can do exactly what I do. You don't need a degree in astrophysics, and you don't need a law degree. You need a degree in, in human nature. You need a degree in understanding people. 
You need a degree in empathy, in listening, in trying to relate and be prepared to make mistakes. Every time I do one of these, I do something wrong. Every time. 9-11. Mr. Feinberg, I'm 71 years old. I lost my son at the Pentagon. He died. He escaped when the plane hit. But he thought that his sister was trapped. So he went back into the Pentagon to look for her. She had escaped through a side door. She was fine. He died looking for her. Mr. Feinberg, I'm 71 and I'm a parent burying a son. It's not supposed to be that way. I looked at him. I said to him, Mr. Jones, terrible, terrible. I know how you feel. Big mistake. Guy looks at me, tears. Mr. Feinberg, you got a tough job. I got some advice for you. Don't ever tell people like me that you know how I feel. You have no idea how I feel. And I, 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 some friendly advice, don't, do, don't, don't say that to people. I'll never say that again. Never say that again. Then I was down in the Gulf of Mexico. Anybody here from Louisiana? Plaquemines Parish. Back far from New Orleans. The president of the parish. There's 300 fishermen in a gymnasium listening to me explain how they can get paid. So the president of the parish introduces me as a model public servant. He says, Mr. Feinberg's down here. He is a model public servant. So I get up and I stop my spiel and I say, I want to thank the president. And I, I'm trying to be a model in getting money out. So I'm trying to be a model. Some fisherman grabs a mic from the back row, 300 people. He says, Mr. Feinberg, stop, stop, Mr. Feinberg. We've read all about you, and you are a model. You really are. You know what a model is, Feinberg? A small replica of the real thing. <laughs> that was the end of that meeting. Got out of hand after that. You got to be careful. You got to be on your guard. And when you take one of these assignments, brace yourself. Brace yourself because it is harrowing. And if you think that anything you've done before can get you reinforce what you're going to hear and expect, it doesn't work that way. But if, if you're asked to do this by President Bush, 9-11, President Obama, BP, Mayor Menino, Boston Marathon, um, the president of Virginia Tech, Governor Hickenlooper of Colorado, the uh, Dark Knight shootings, you do it. I do it because you would do it. We're all American citizens. If, if, a, if a policymaker decides to call on you and ask you to do something, you do it. You do it. And that's the way it is. You don't go looking for these things. And that's the last point to make here today. I don't decide whether or not it's a good idea to compensate people. Policymakers make that decision. The American people often make that decision. I get involved because a decision's already been made to set up a compensation program. And now somebody's got to design it, implement it, administer it. I don't call, some, I don't call the president. The president calls me and the mayor, and the governor of Massachusetts. If they called you, you'd do it. That's part of being an American citizen. And I think that gets us back, finally, to Ben Green. Ben Green was appointed to the federal bench by a fair-haired son of Massachusetts, President Kennedy. I grew up as a teenager when President Kennedy was elected. 
government and government service and the public interest and helping your fellow Americans meant an altogether different time, you see. He knew what President Kennedy instilled, not only in Ben Green, but in a, thousands and thousands of Americans, the urge to serve, to give something back to the community. You don't see it enough today. You don't see it enough today. So when I'm asked to deliver the Ben Green lecture, I'd like to think that maybe at least the distinguished jurist Ben Green and myself, maybe we do have something in common. We owe a debt of gratitude to President Kennedy and what he stood for on this next month, next month, the 50th anniversary of his death. So there we are. We've still got about 10 minutes. The, the, the powers that be at Case Western, they run a tight ship, <laughs> I'll tell you. And we have, we've left about 10 minutes for questions, and then there'll be a reception. So who has questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, I don't know if you've heard about this case right here in Cleveland in May, these three girls that were kidnapped and held captive for like 10 years or whatever. OK, so a couple weeks later, I noticed all around the city these billboards and a website with this fund that was started for these people. In fact, I work for a big law firm here in town, and they gave us a free dress down day if we contributed to this charity. So when you look closer at the thing in really fine print, I mean, they had these girls' names, Michelle, Gina, uh, Amanda. And then at the very bottom, it said, profits or, or money goes to agencies to help these kinds of cases. So like, talk about a, you know, a money grab. What, what do you think of something like that where they're using I don't know anything about it. The Attorney General of the State of Ohio ought to look into it and see if it's a legitimate um, a fund, uh, a fund or not. Does, is it a 501c3? Did the IRS give him a 501c3 status? I don't know anything about it, but it happens all the time. It happens all the time. You know, help Johnny, help Mary. I don't know if it's legit, but the, the state AG ought to be looking at that. So, Mr. Feinberg, you mentioned, um, or one of your key points was that you think that these funds will almost never exist again. And uh, at 9 11. The, well, well, right, right, something like that. And, at the, and, at, and in the public level, I understand that. Uh, you know, September 11th was such an unusual and outsized event that perhaps that was the only response. Um, you also indicated BP. Something like that may almost never happen again. But with BP, uh, we're finding that, and maybe this is the picky nature of, Louisi of the Louisiana legal system, that there are now, as I'm, I'm sure you're aware, many torts claims that I'm sure your fund denied, and now they're going back and suing, and BP is sort of banging its head against a wall and saying, I thought we were protected from this. What, what happened? Isn't it so... Going with that, seeing as you know, BP doesn't obviously doesn't want to litigate any of these. Do you think that maybe perhaps there would be more funds in a mass tort situation like that, or if not, why not? Why in not a, in a corporate setting, whether it's BP or Bhopal or anything like that? First of all, when you say will there be more BP funds, there's two reasons I doubt it. I, I think it would be a great idea, by the way. I think in mass aggregative litigation, the approach taken that we've taken in BP or 9-11 is a better way for mass aggregative litigation. There's two problems with it. One, first of all, maybe you can find a company like BP that has 20 billion to put up. That's a lot of money to put up front without any finding of liability. So I don't think you'll see that. Secondly, I must say BP seems to be having buyer's remorse. They put up this money, the program worked, I got out, done. Now there's all sorts of new lawsuits being filed. Uh, BP claiming they're ineligible, they're bogus, uh, they, they shouldn't be paid, and now they're fighting that. So it, you, you got to question whether the next time will BP front $20 billion or will it say Exxon Valdez is the way to go? They've only paid in 22 years $6 billion or four billion. We have already paid six and a half billion and we're still in court. So I mean there's all sorts of challenges to these approaches. Next. Yes, sir. 
Um, you started by saying that these programs, the couple of them, were alternatives to the tort system. Um, I handle plaintiff's class actions, and it's a very poor way of determining these disputes. It's like making victim compensation depend on the outcome of a contact sport. Um, what, what would be an alternative, uh, aside from one of these unusual events with an act of Congress, to resolving these disputes? I think what you do is the alternative. It was done right. I, 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 um, I don't know about you. I'm very troubled at the trends in the law over the last 20 years that, that undercut efforts at aggregative litigation. I think the Rule 23 class action or various state classes, ways to aggregate, overseen by a neutral judge, I think that's far preferable under the rule of law to setting up special programs just for you, just for you, just for you, and nobody else. So my solution to all of this remains, I'm a, a big believer in the, the benefits uh, of uh, the efficiency and speed benefits of real class action law that isn't hampered by um, efforts to undercut, deny certification, deny claims, um, that's the problem. And the reason that the 9-11 fund, and I think the BP fund, um, is, is, is attractive to people is that it's an alternative to attempting to aggregate in a much more efficient, quick way, rather than you banging your head against the, the, the wall, trying to get the courts and the judiciary and the defendant to agree that an aggregative certification makes sense. That's the way I would go if I had my druthers as a policymaker. A few more? Yes, ma'am. Hold on, you're next. It's my understanding that in addition to the, and this is the first I knew that there, the federal government put up money for the 9-11 Victims Fund. Wasn't there a lot, weren't there a lot of other public donations and what happened with that those monies. There were a lot of other private charitable donations, about another two and a half billion dollars. That's separate. That had nothing to do with me. In fact, you could make an argument that the statute required me to offset that money that went to a fireman's widow, five million dollars, before I even cut the check. The trouble with that is I went to see those charities and I said, you know, under the law, I may have to deduct what you give the firemen. No, well, the, the charity said, you're going to do that? We're going to hold back all of our money till you cut your check because we're not subsidizing the taxpayer. Well, I blinked. I'm going to be responsible for holding back millions, billions of dollars in charitable money. I said, yeah, you're right. I'm not going to deduct it. So a fireman, my, a fireman's widow got on average two million tax-free from me and another three million from private charity, which was a separate, wholly apart from what I was doing. Yes, sir. Private litigants in that case. Uh, in which case? The um, the 9/11. Did you did you track any of the private litigations to see if your numbers were more or less uh, in line with what happened? It's all confidential. The 94 that settled, but um, um, I think probably uh, some people might have got more, some people got less. Don't forget though, you're giving 25 percent to your lawyer then there's costs and fees, and above all, there's five years of litigation with a constant reminder of the horror that day, and the lost loved one, I think it's a no-brainer. For defendants, huh? everybody they could find? For I'm sorry? For defendants in those cases, did they list the airline, everybody, the yeah. airlines, everybody? Yeah, everybody. American Air uh, Airlines, World Trade Center, Boeing for not putting a cockpit door that was firm. So there uh, were a thousand lawyers on the other side. Yeah. They all settled eventually. I don't mind, you know, by the way, you talk about human nature. If somebody decided to sue rather than take the 9-11 money, fine. That's, the statute gives you that right. That didn't bother me at all. What bothered me to this day, there were two people who did nothing. 
They never came into the 9-11 fund, and they never filed a lawsuit. I met them both. One was a priest who lost a brother. Father, you're going to get about 2.3 million for the death of your brother. Why haven't you filed? I don't think it's right. Father, you lost your mind? There's $2.3 million. Give it to Catholic Charities in your brother's name. Not appropriate. What? He didn't take the money. Then I went and I visited in Brooklyn with a 75-year-old woman who lost her son. Mrs. Jones, the statute runs out in two more weeks. I'm here with an application. I'll help you fill it out. You sign it. You're going to get about $2.8 million tax-free. No, I lost my son. You're here to offer me money? My son's gone. Mrs. Jones, listen to me. Take the money. Memorialize your son. Set up an endowment. Set up a charity in your son's name. Mr. Feinberg, I can't even get out of bed, and you want me to sign? Leave the application on the kitchen table. You can go now. She never filled it out. You learn, you learn that grief can paralyze people, paralyze them, so that you can't fathom how I went, this lady, I think, I, if I remember, I don't remember, I think I went and saw her other son or her, or her brother, God's sakes, get the lady to sign the document. I'll get her the check. She could. She won't listen to us. Those really hurt. The others, if they decided to sue, that was their business. I want to um, thank uh, this great law school for the um, honor of, of being here today. I got to thank Roe on behalf of her father, who um, was obviously... Um, a great public servant and a friend of the law school. And for all of you who came here today, this is the last lecture. Ro may think that over again, I don't know. But, um, but all, thank you very much for participating here. Today. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Jonathan Anton. I'm the academic dean. I spend a good part of my life in meetings. Um, if you think I spend a lot of time in meetings, the dean spends even more of his time in meetings, and he had to leave uh, a little bit early. So Dean Mitchell asked me if I would formally close the program by thanking uh, Mr. Feinberg for a terrific program. Uh, this is a, if this is indeed the final lecture in the series, I think that uh, it's going out with a big bang. Uh, thanks again. Please join us out in the lower rotunda for a reception and you can continue the conversation. Thanks again. Thank you.